Good morning. So we have uh, been in the middle of a series of lessons looking at something you requested from us in our last congregation meeting to, to go through practical uh, answers to our the shifts we had is in terms of where the uh, what's appropriate for a man and woman to be involved with and and contribute in a congregational sense and so we said we're going to give you some practical suggestions and we're going to go through a quick history uh, and then ending next week with jeff talking in first Corinthians 14 where a lot of the challenges and uh, conversations we've had have led to so uh, i'm picking up this the last two weeks which are both online on our youtube Channels, you can check them out if you've missed them or want to fill in the gaps or kind of want to know where I'm at or where I've been if you have not been here. Um, you're welcome to do that or just to review it. And we have given some practical suggestions right up front. I'll quickly summarize that based on the scriptural prim uh, principles, you're going to expect that the men are the ones doing the leading in the congregation, and that means practically that they will be the ones teaching. I'll, I'm up here teaching to the congregation. Uh, you will not find a woman up here teaching. Uh, we will also say those that we expect, the men and the women, the children, the, the visitors, that everyone is participating in conversation. So if we ask a question, we expect, feel free to respond. And we believe that's biblically grounded, and we uh, uh, work through the scriptures to show that, and we're willing to have more conversations, but we are trying to close the door on the, the ongoing conversation we're having with the congregation. So, uh, but if you got questions about how it's come chat with me, Jeff, any of them, uh, that have been involved with this, and we're happy to discuss in more detail and do more Bible study with you. So let's uh, jump into this. Last week, we actually had, oh, by the way, you turned to Ephesians, uh, we're going to start there. Uh, but last couple of weeks, we looked at, first of all, at creation. How did God create us? What was the purposes with which we were created? And how did those roles uh, play out in history? So it began with not only the creation, uh, but then we see that role of a man being put in the garden, saying to be fruitful and multiply, and to tend the garden, that work uh, is where it began. And then he says, well, you need a help work suitable. So it creates a woman as a help me for the man, but that helps him in those roles, both of working and of continuing uh, being fruitful and multiplying. And then when the curse came, comes along, we see that both of those particular roles or jobs are plagued, and they're, they're, they get harder. Um, so the man who's working now has to work to grow up harder. And the, the woman who's to be a help to her husband finds that in childbearing, um, it's going to get a whole lot more challenging. And in being a partner uh, to her husband, it also is more challenging. And says that the husband will rule over and she'll want his position. And so there's this challenge right from the outset that happens. And we've talked last week uh, and the week before going through the Old Testament, looking at many examples of the way this role plays out and, and the sin and the problems that lead <coughs> to that and how these the roles continue to a lot, uh, guide of that progression of scriptures. And so I also began last week with just a call for a particular uh, patience uh, from you, and I'm going to reiterate a little of that this week just because I want to make sure we are aligned. When I say a phrase or a word or like identity um, or I say headship, it is likely that you're going to have varying levels of understanding. In your mind, you're picturing your connotation, and it may or may not be what I'm saying. And so what I challenged you with last week, and I want to continue to challenge you with, look at the scriptures you're presenting. Try to look at them in context. Our goal is to come to scriptures, not to take our ideas and our, our backgrounds and say, all right, this is, well, let me find some scriptures that help us understand this. It's supposed to be the flip. We're supposed to come to scriptures and let scriptures shape our understanding so that we represent what we see in a biblical term, in a biblical way. And that's a hard thing to do, uh, but what it does requires that when we're having dialogue like this, we need to be patient. When you hear something, by, you hear something I say, don't just say, oh, well, he, obviously he means X, but think about what the scriptures lead to that, and, and let's work to find the, biblic, the biblical answer, the biblical truth uh, that aligns throughout scriptures. All right, so let's get into it. I've got a lot to get through, and you know, know my propensity to dive deeper and spend more time, and I really can't do that this week, but I have six scriptures, or five scriptures to go through, and so I'm gonna go pretty fast, and so I will encourage you, as we go through this, if you've got questions or more things that we don't have time to deal with, read it at home. Give me a call. We can talk more in detail um, as needed. Um, in Ephesians, 
And one of the passages that really look at the role of this ex- this role expression in the New Testament uh, is outlined in Ephesians. And so I'll give some context here. In chapter four, uh, it, it begins with this call to unity, uh, both of the roles uh, that are there. It specifically says in verse one, "Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called." And oh, sorry, I'm losing my passage here. Sorry. So in terms of the so worthy of the calling which you have been called, um, a calling is a role. And what we're going to find is I kind of suggested in the Old Testament, these roles that were defined at the beginning are one of many roles given to God's people. There are many roles that we are to fulfill, um, whether they be in terms of what is it to be a husband, what is it to be a father, what is it to be a wife, what is it to be... Uh, a child of God, what is it to be an apostle, what is it to be a prophet, what is it to be a child of God. All of these things have roles associated with them, and we're called to certain tasks, and this is not a bad thing, it's something that God designed. And so when we embrace it, we find that we truly find freedom and actually are able to more effectively shine a light in the process. So I will cover today in some of these passages other areas where roles are highlighted, where, uh, where God is call people to a particular pattern, and then they live under it. So in, in that in mind, you know, this passage begins in chapter 4, where he's calling to unity. He says, I implore you to be in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And in verse 7, it says, but each one of us grace was given, which as we look at these callings, as we look at what God called me to be, we're going to find that it's challenging. Both from a standpoint, sometimes it's difficult work, but often it's more that our selfish natures collide with what God calls us to do. And because of that, we're going to find many of our roles that we're called to are going to be challenging. Therefore, this is bathed in grace. It's a gift founded in grace that begins with verse 7. Verse 11, if we keep skipping down, is, and he had. he has some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. For... Let's do this, the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith, the knowledge of Jesus, and into full maturity. This is the picture of many other roles that are at the beginning of this called unity, and that in the body of believers, we find many different roles. In these roles, you might ask, well, hey, I'm called to be a prophet, but I, I wanted to be an evangelist. Is this fair? Yet God says he has equipped us for particular purposes. The heart behind this is that whatever gifts and things that God is developing and working in you, which may obviously change over time, but whatever that role is, this is something we should seek to fulfill and to uh, blossom in so that we are faithful to God's calling. So if we look at Ephesians 4, look down at verse 17, so this I say, therefore, to, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. The reason I bring this particular passage is we're setting up is that the ungodly, uh, this is what, who they're referring to in the, the Gentile passage here, those that don't embrace God, don't accept God, don't think the way that we're called to think. So it should be no surprise that when we come to good biblical conclusions, we're going to find that the culture around us may sometimes agree, but sometimes even hate us for it, and be far away from what we believe and understand. And so this part is described here, saying the ungodly reason in different ways, and often are led centrally, which in other words means they do what feels good. That's how they often reason through, how do I respond here? How do I behave? And so, that being said, if we jump into Ephesians 5, as we continue in this, the first verse, uh, verses 1 through 21, uh, look at uh, being imitators of God. And these roles include proper behavior that, um, like it says, verse 10, pleases the Lord. 
And it ends in this last verse uh, of that section, 21. It says, or let's go to 20. It says, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This becomes kind of a header for the sections that follow. In our role of being someone who pleases the Lord, we are called to subject to one another. What does that look like? What does that mean? Well, the next few passages begin to take individual roles and the way that uh, this higher level role of subjecting to one another plays out in the roles that God has assigned, divine, designed us in, or we find ourselves in. So the first one they bring up is husbands and wives. It moves on to fathers and children, and then it moves to masters and slaves. So I want to look through a little more of those in detail. Uh, in verse 22, let's begin reading there. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their wife, own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with refer reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. So, in this relationship between husbands and wives, how does this subjecting to one another play out? Well, it says in verses 22 through 24, the husband is the head of wife, and wife is to submit to her husband. So, what does this mean? What does it mean to submit? What does it mean to be a head? Um, so I thought we might look a little more detail at this compared to this particular analogy is compared to Christ and the church, is the analogy, the example we're given to reason through with it, which gives us some insight, but also brings, I could think, many more questions. So if we look at proper headship first, what is headship? How is it described in the scripture? Well, I quickly got to run through this, and I have some verses that you can um, cross-reference, but man's headship among what it means, includes some very specific things. It includes loving the wife more than his own desires. And that's mentioned multiple times in that passage. It means loving his wife to the extent of laying down his own life, which is coupled closely with that first one. It includes loving his wife for her spiritual success of being holy and blameless, and the way he does this is by focusing their relationship around Jesus. It includes his loving his wife with the intent to find complete unity in Christ. And so these are some of the key principles that I think headship describe. And I think they make sense. I mean, if you think about what does a leader do in an organization, even in the world of organizations that we're familiar with. Well, a good leader draws people together around a common goal, around a common point. Well, this idea of headship in a home is that the man's role is to help make sure the tone, the direction that what pulls together is Christ. And so that's part of that headship. And in that process, it brings the, the body of the family into a deeper walk with Jesus. And there's this a specific role of that domain of of the water of the word, or Jesus, or the, the scriptures, are what bathes the family. And it brings about unity in Christ as the, in this process. So, continue on the, on the woman, what does it mean to submit? Well, we don't get a lot of descriptions in this particular passage about that, but one at the end, it says women's submission clearly includes respecting their husbands. 
and not just respecting in lip service, but in heart. There's this nature of this being a fully committed thing both for the man actually caring for the wife, not just saying, yeah, I'm the leader, but actually leading by laying down his life. And the wife submitting in a way that actually is sincere and genuine. And we're going to find a similar theme as we go forward. If we look at a couple of these other uh, roles really quickly, um, in ch chapter 6, let's just read quickly the first uh, four verses um, where it deals with her fathers and children. Um, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So verses 1 through 3, children express being subject to one another, this, this, this theme through this passage, by specifically obeying their parents. Not that complicated, not that hard. However, it doesn't stop there. It's not simply, I do everything mom and dad says. It's much deeper. It says that they are to honor their father and mother. So not only are there obedience here, but there's a goal, a desire to honor, to, to fulfill this role. Similarly, on the father's side, fathers are, in verse 4, expressed to being subject to one another is in a way of bringing up their children and the discipline and admonition of the Lord. And so it's a father's role to teach and discipline his child about God. Uh, once again, uh, this shouldn't be a shock, it's not the point of this lesson, so I don't spend long on it, but it's not the uh, church's role, it's not the pastor's role. Matter of fact, here it's even not the primary role of the mother, although she certainly plays a big part of this. It is the father's role to teach their children. Therefore, if your children have not been taught, that comes back to you as a father. But similarly, it's not simply just teaching. It's saying, hey, you have to do it in such a way that's sincere, that's fully in. Fathers must not exasperate the children. So notice that in each of these three scenarios, all of them have to be sincere and fully committed. It's not simply going through the actions, but it's this part that says, I want to be fully committed and fulfill this. So. Each have different roles that must be embraced to probably perform. Um, masters and slaves, let's look at uh, that real quick, verses um, 5 through 9. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them and give up their master, give up, sorry, give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. So here are a couple of points I'll just quickly do. The slaves and their role of being subject to one another, do it through obeying the master with sincerity of heart as to Christ. That's their focal point. This says nothing about the quality of the master. It says the quality of the direction. The slave is serving the master and does it with sincerity of heart that seeing that they're serving the Lord. So anyway, the masters are told to treat the slaves without threatening as fellow slaves of God. And it goes into this context, the same thing that we see in the other two passages of sincerity. So, let's jump to the next passage. First Peter. If you want to turn over with me, we're going to go through a few of the passages in here. So high-level overview of um, 1 Peter, which we're not going to go through the whole book, but I do want to give a high level. It begins the first chapter and a half. Our identity calls us to holiness and hope. And I want to read a couple of passages that highlight that. Then it moves into submission, that we're called to submit, and that there are many authorities we're to submit to to reflect God and the purpose behind that and then it moves on loving one another um, and that in this service we should expect that we're going to suffer just like Christ did and then we use our roles to please the Lord so don't give up alright so in that context we uh, chapter 1 uh, just let me see verses 3 through 5 blessed be the Lord God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, 
who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is our hope and, uh, and part of our identity. So if we continue, jump down to verse 13. It says, therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now this is the introduction to this book. We jump over in the chapter uh, 2, beginning verses 4 through 5, we see this command, this identity that moves into our behavior is being put into this wonderful picture of being a, a, a living stones. And so it says in verse 4 of chapter 2, And coming to him as to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is the picture of the church. Now, Let's jump into the particular passages of interest in uh, 2 Peter, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, um, jump down to verse 13. And it transitions out of this living stone to say this Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for punishment or e of evildoers, and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slave of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Then it continues on with servants. Once again, how this role, this principle of submission plays out in the role. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God a man bears up under sorrow and suffering unjustly. For what credit is there when you are sin and are harshly treated? You endure it with patience. But if you do it when what is right and suffer for it, will you patiently endure it? This finds favor with God. All right, so... A little different tone to First Peter than what we see in Ephesians. So Ephesians talks specifically about that sincerity of heart. That this is what you're called to do. This is your role. Live it. Fill it. Fulfill it to honor God. But do it sincerely. Wholeheartedly. Not simply working through it. In this particular passage, we see a, a, a little different scope. What is that? Well, he says that this may not be very ideal. We're going to see that play out a little more here. So in the first case of slaves, what does he say? Well, your slave owner may not be that good of a man. You may get beat for something you didn't even deserve. However, they're still called to stay the course, to submit. Because by submitting, they suddenly divert the attention to God instead of to themselves. Not just here, we're going to see it continue. Let's um, pick up and... Uh, See. Uh, the, the next example, which is kind of our preeminent example of Christ, it says in verse 21, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. What example is he following here? Yeah, I'm there. Be humble, but also what, what's going to happen to you here? It definitely is hinged on being humble, but what's the context? Well, we just read it, so what's it leading up to? What is Jesus calling you to? Yeah, Joe. Well, suffering, maybe, ultimately death, maybe. Yeah. Hopefully not. There is clearly a, 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 an expectation to followers of God that there will be suffering. So we have to make sure that we're not trying to paint a picture that does not involve suffering. If we do, then we're not realistically looking through scriptures. And this is one of many passages, but nonetheless, let's, let's read through how Christ did this. It says, he gives you for an example for you to follow in his steps. Verse 22, who committed no sin, Jesus was perfect, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. 
And he himself bore our sins in his body and on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd, the guardian of your souls. So here we're given a very clear preeminent example of Christ, who also was treated wrongly in the role that God assigned for him. Was he being treated fairly? No. Matter of fact, to the extent that he not only suffered, but as Jeff points out, he died. And when he's being led to the slaughter, it says that he did not revile or call out in his defense, but he entrusted himself to God and let God be his defender. This is the example given to us in this passage. So the pastors before this dealt with slaves and their roles, and the slave owners challenged to them and their roles. Now let's look in chapter 3. It begins with the men and the women. Beginning of verse 1, In the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by your behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. And let not your adornment be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. The Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right, without being frightened by any fear. You husbands likewise live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker vessel, since she is a woman, and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So what do we find here? So wives beginning of the verse are to submit to husbands. Similar passages what we've seen in many other areas. Even though this is the unique part here, even if the man is ungodly. Well, how do we make sense of that? Well, they, they further argue it. They said, well, the wife is to attract the husband to the truth. <clears throat> Remember the last Ephesians passage talks about the man washing the water, the wife in the water of the word. If a good leader is doing what he's supposed to do, He's leading this effort, but in this case, he's not being very involved. So he says, well, the wife is to attract the husband to truth by chaste or, or simple and respectful behavior. Continues on verses 3 through 5. Wife's beauty, which is, quote, precious in the sight of God, is when it's found in a meek and quiet spirit, not simply external aspects like bringing hair and, and other adornments. Verse 6, wife's submission is choosing righteousness over fear. Why did they throw that in here? Sure. Well, because sometimes her husband may want her to do something that's not right. He may want her to not, for example, uh, have fellowship with other Christians. He may object to her going up to the rooftop to pray. Mm -hmm. um, and But if she is to obey Jesus, first of all, her husband may disagree, and maybe he won't be kind. Very well stated. There, are, in this situation where there is a mismatch of a, a, a believer yoked with an unbeliever, there's a challenge here, and the woman in this particular passage is a little more at a disadvantage, but in our mind, worldly mindsets, but not so to God. God says no. Here's your role. Here's how you fulfill this in this non-ideal situation. It's something good. Yeah, Heather. I think even in any situation, it's frightening at some level to choose to give up control. Even if you are under the authority of someone godly, it's scary because what if you don't get your own way? Yeah. You know? And I think that's where it comes in. Am I going to trust what God says is right for my life and choose to live it out? Am I going to try to make sure to protect myself? Also well stated. This very nature of looking out for my own interests versus living up to what God calls and entrusting myself to him. As it said right before this passage, Jesus is like led to a lamb to slaughter, entrusted himself in the hands of God, knowing that God was capable and faithful to deliver. The wife's called to the same thing, and so it says choose righteousness over fear. <coughs> 
The husband's also challenged. Husbands must listen to the wife, or God doesn't listen to him. So you take the flip situation where they maybe a different uh, unevenly yoked, and you've got a man that's a believer and a woman who's not. And this place kind of kind of is reminiscent of the idea of the, the gossip, the continual chatter, the continual problem uh, that Proverbs refers to, that even if your wife as a husband is problematic, you're supposed to still be patient and listen. Otherwise, God said, I'm not going to listen to you. Interesting. And furthermore, in terms of uh, the, the husband and wife's relationship with God, their partner heirs. So they should treat each other with that type of respect, which comes in at the heart of a lot of the other passages we were uh, leading up to last week. So, let's, uh, three more passages and then we'll be done. Uh, with uh, Titus 2, 1 through 8, uh, I'm, once again, I'd love to do more of a holistic, full book study because I think it gives us a much more insight on how these, what the context of these passages are and I strongly encourage you to do this. We've done this in our longer class um, but at this point I want to quickly go through it so I'm going to jump right into the heart of this passage. Chapter 2 verses 1 through 8. It says, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, and love and perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior. Not malicious gossips, no enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Now this is, once again, an instruction to both old men, old women, young men, young women. All of them have different roles to fulfill in this. That's okay. That's good. What are the roles that are being called out? How does it differentiate between the men and the women? We look particularly that verse 3 says that the women are to be reverent in behavior, and to, or this is the older women, to be reverent in behavior and to teach the younger women. So, one part of this is this idea of submission, which unfortunately in our today's culture, if you submit, that means you're useless, is the way our culture defines that. Far from it. Matter of fact, very valuable, even in the context of, of another one of Paul's letters, he's underscoring their need to teach and this role and responsibility of sharing and training up is writing the older women to teach the younger women. And so what, as we keep going down to the next few verses, uh, love their husbands and their children, workers at home subject to their husbands so God is not dishonored. And so we also have this, once again, the subjection is saying that it is a reflection, if it's not obeyed, not done, it dishonors God. And similar with the husbands, I think we've already from the other passages we looked at. So we have these roles and we need to fulfill them and we need to do them well with sincerity and even in non-ideal situations. And so uh, another common theme we see coming out of this uh, is a very end here. Taken by a sound of speech, which is beyond her folks, that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. In the context of these behaviors and these roles, when we do what is right, by choice, we take our freedom and we willingly choose to accept the roles that God has given us, it puts our opponents to shame, having nothing bad to say about us, which is part of this larger context. And it's in other passages that say very similar things in the behavior, like in 1 Peter, where we just went. So let's keep jumping down to the next one, 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. Once again, in this passage, the issue of headship or authority, want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. What does that mean, by the way? Lifting up holy hands. What are hands that are holy? It means that they're hands that are set apart. So this is basically saying, I want men everywhere to lift up their hands to the Lord and say, these are your hands. This is, it could even be argued is reminiscent of creation, that this is the man placed in the garden saying, hey, bring glory to me, go work, use your hands for tending my work and participating in that work. This is those holy hands that have been set apart for that work. 
Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good work, as is proper for a woman making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve, and it was not man, Adam, who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity and self-restraint. We've spent months talking through a lot of the details of this passage and what they mean and how they play out. But there's some high-level things that I just want to highlight. This is, continues with that creation thing. Uh, the woman in her role, um, the man in his role of, of work, we've talked about that, the woman in her role of being a help me, says that it's part of that submissive, accepting that headship. And, and, and then it even goes through the fall and how that played out. Uh, so let's keep going. Got a couple more passages, that, uh, or well, one last book, but, uh, and, and some passages from it. So 1 Corinthians is another passage that unfolds like Ephesians and 1 Peter and has a lot of structure from the beginning to the end that helps us understand it, um, as you would expect. Can't go through all of that, but I do want to quickly touch the passage. So if you will, turn to me in 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to hop through a few passages really quickly. Chapters 1 and 2 and begin with a call to unity amidst a divisive and struggling church. Verse 10. Just to highlight this, it says, Now I exhort you, brethren, in the, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been conformed concerning you, my brethren. And he goes on to talk about the quarrels. So, jumping down, he immediately shifts out of this issue of saying, Hey, you've got conflict, you should be unified. You've got all this conflict. And so he immediately steps into, Well, how are we going to deal with conflict? Well, we need wisdom. So let's talk about wisdom. He starts with the wisdom of God. Um, verses, um, let's see. Uh, actually, I, I do want to note, we've been studying James on Wednesday night. Same transition here. The issue of, I've got a struggle. It's big. You call me to unity, that's impossible. Yeah? How do we do the impossible? Well, let's, let's, let's seek the wisdom of God. And so you see that same transition in James. It happens here. It happens in other passages. And so it shifts to the wisdom of God. Verse, uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 14, it, it's shifting into reliance upon the Spirit. And in verse 14 it says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, that he himself is appraised by no man. And, and it goes on to talk through that we've got to be careful as we wrestle through this, that our culture and our world around us that does not accept God will not see eye to eye to us with what the scriptures represent if we represent scriptures correctly. There will be times where they'll say, wow, that's wonderful, our boy, and we have defense as we read at the end of uh, Titus. But there will be many other times where they're just not going to agree with us. That, that's the world. That's okay. But we want to make sure not only that we're just accepting something blindly, I'm not asking you to do it, but let's help let the scriptures wash our minds, renew our minds, that we may see clearly and can represent things correctly. And so in this passage, they're saying it's a contrast between the fool and a wise person is the one that allows the Spirit of God to re-represent things. And that's, we're not quite here yet, so let me... Uh, if you jump down to chapter 3, it calls out the Corinthians for being unable to handle God's wisdom. Uh, I want to read one particular passage, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, and you are not, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? Paul goes on to talk about the foundation he's setting and how to build and understand truth. But here he clearly states uh, a theme for the book of Corinthians. They're unable to handle the wisdom of God. And so he challenges them and says, I'm going to get really simple, really practical, down to the milk. And I should be well beyond this, but I still can't. And so he follows in this pattern, which we're going to see in the next many chapters, although I say we're going to see... Go home and read it, um, but but uh, I, I will 
I'm going to go from this premise, but each of these chapters keep hitting on things. Paul states a clear biblical truth. And then he plays out that truth in the situation that they're in so that they can reason through it. He states a truth, and then he gives them what I would argue is milk as they wrestle through practically how that principle plays out in their situation. And so with that in mind, we see him run through a lot of issues. Uh, the, um, the uh, let's see, if, in the next chapters as he goes through, he talks about types of food that should be eaten or should not be eaten or whether they could be eaten. He talks about lawsuits. Uh, he talks about marriage. He talks about various other expressions of freedom taken without consideration of the body. And so these are the practical details given the milk that helps them understand the truth. So in chapter 11, which is where I'm going to end today, and I've got the notes already written up here. In chapter 11, he once again builds a foundation uh, talking about this authority principle that we just can't seem to get away with the script, away from the scriptures. It's everywhere. Uh, so we need to make sure we understand and embrace it right. He says, verse 3, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and that man is the head of a woman, and that God is the head of Christ. Now this principle, this founding uh, biblical structure, is placed, once again, like it is in all the other passages throughout the First Corinthians, and in many other books, for that matter. And then he goes in and starts fleshing it out. Well, all right, what does that mean in this context? You jump down to verse 7. Well, for a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but man for the woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels, or because of the messengers. So, you take this passage that starts with the principle, and then it immediately moves into this somewhat specific and detailed explanation. What does it mean to have a man to not cover his head and a woman to cover her head? Well, we've been arguing over this as a church for thousands of years. We have lots of different answers, a lot of very passionate people about what this means. One thing I can tell you pretty confidently, I, I've got my own opinions, I can talk all day about them, but if we're going to be godly people, don't you think we should be obeying scriptures? Yeah. So how do I make sense of this passage here? I'm looking out there, I don't see a single woman's head covered, except for one. All right, Barbara, you're godly. Everyone else, you're going to help, all right? So, so how do we make sense of this? Is that what it means? Because if, if we're commanded to do this, and we're saying, well, that's just stupid, I'm not going to do it. Oh, sorry, Korean too. You, you have your head covered also. We have two head covers. Thank you. So, uh, but nonetheless, if, if that's explicitly what it means, then we got a lot of ungodly people in our f fellowship right now. And, and maybe that's true. And if that's true, don't you think we should be actively pursuing how to make it right? Yes. But for some reason... All of you have seen the scripture plenty of times, at least the ones that have been in my class at all, and we're not doing it, except for a few. And maybe not for the same reasons, I don't know. This is a principle, and then it's flushed out in milk. And at the bottom of the milk, what does it say? The woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, which brings us back to the principle. What is being stated here, undeniably, is that Christ is the head of every man, man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. This is what we have to fulfill in whatever it looks like in my home, in my church, in my workplace. This is what I'm called to do. Because this is the way God designed me. The way it worked out in 1 Corinthians, or the core of the church at this time, was with this issue of head covering, which we can't even quite get our head around, whether this means women with their hair up, whether it means there's actually a physical covering, whether it means that it's actually the hair, which I completely deny is, because it just doesn't fit in with the scripture, um, but it's not in self consistent But all these uh, issues that come up, how do we make sense of them? Well, we need to work hard to make sense of them if it's a literal interpretation. But I think I would rather spend time on the first one, which is the principle, and say, well, what does it mean for me 
and for my wife, for example, and my children to express this headship in a clear way. And I want to make sure I fulfill that primarily. Then we can work on some of the other details as we go on. At the end here, it pops back out with kind of a, you know, you have some strong statements here, and then as it has happened throughout history, what do men do when they read a passage like this? Not all men, but ungodly men, what do they do? They take and whack their, their wives over the head with it and say, see, you have to submit to me. Completely misunderstanding all the scriptures. So, pulls it back in. However, don't take this out of context. But neither is a woman independent from man, nor is a man independent of a woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has its birth through the woman, and all things come from God. This is continual grounding to these principles. And so it's a challenge to us. Let's, let's make sure we're following through with that. Uh, so continue on chapter 12, steps back into general gifts, how their usage is intended, yet how the Corinthians pervert it uh, with this jealousy principle. Uh, sorry, they, they take jealousy to undermine the principles. So chapter 13 then talks about love and back into general gifts and how their usage is intended, yet how the Corinthians, sorry, uh, the love and the I'm losing my notes here. Talk, talks about love driving the heart, and then we step into 14 and begin to flush out these principles once again, back to this core in chapter 14 in the context of an assembly. And so, even at the bottom of chapter 11, uh, he takes one example in the assembly, talking about the Lord's Supper. He says, You take this principle, and even in the case of something so simple as you coming together and taking the Lord's Supper, you screw it up. That's the end of chapter 11, if you want to read verse, starting in verse probably 17-ish. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together, I, as a church, I hear there's the visions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. So it's going back saying you're violating these principles, and we see the headship of Christ being denied in this, because instead of considering the body, what do they consider? Their own selfishness. And so they violate it. And then, and then we keep going, they flush out various other cases. And so when we get to chapter 14, they look much more deeply into the assembly when we're gathered. And Jeff's going to talk about that next week, so I'm going to leave it for Jeff. Um, and in closing, as we look throughout this entire book that God has given us, from creation to revelations, God speaks through Moses, then Solomon, then Peter, and Paul, very consistently on this idea of headship and authority. If we deny it or say, well, it's out of context or something, then I don't think we've actually read our scriptures because our scriptures aren't just mentioning it once and taking out of context. It continually underscores it over and over and over. So you think I harp on it? I'm just simply harping on it less than scriptures harps on it. Our goal is to understand it, appreciate it, and embrace it. And that's what I'm hoping we've done a little bit of bringing out the, the calling for each of us. It's beautiful, the roles that we've been given. If we can rise and live in them, fulfill them, then we're truly going to bring honor to God, whether it be a difficult situation or a good situation. So, May God be glorified in the way that we live this out. All right, thanks. Let's stand.